Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more Conversations. With us is the gifted writer, Ken Oletta, author of 10 books, featured columnist for you name it, The New Yorker, The Village Voice, New York Magazine, and consummate profiler of the likes of Barry Diller, Bill Gates, Rupert Murdoch, and Michael Bloomberg. In 1978, Ken Oletta wrote a prescient Esquire profile of Roy Cohn, the chief counsel to Senator Joseph McCarthy, master of the smear during the Red Scare of the 1950s, and later a pugnacious and embattled attorney, himself the target of three federal indictments. Cohn was a mentor to his client and friend Donald Trump and tutored Trump in the importance of entertainment, the dark side of politics, sharp litigation practice and manipulation of the media. Cohn, like Trump, had a bullying nature, yet always considered himself a victim, or as King Lear put it, more sinned against than sinning. <laughs> Ken Oletta's Esquire piece was republished 38 years later during the presidential race. Its informing insights into Trump's character and the way he conducts himself in the White House remain relevant to this day. Ken, welcome to the program. Good to be here. Now, how did you get interested in Roy Cohn? Well, I, 78, uh, I was writing a column for the Daily News. Uh, I was doing a, I was host, co-hosting a, a weekly show on, on uh, Channel 13. Um, I, I just started actually writing for the New Yorker then too. Uh, but in covering New York, which is what I mostly did for, for the Daily News, I kept encountering the fact that this guy Roy Cohn, who had been disgraced in the Army McCarthy hearings representing, as you said, Gen Senator McCarthy, um, was a power broker in New York. And I was kind of curious about how that came about. He was a partner of Stanley Friedman, who was the Bronx County Democratic leader uh, in law practice. Uh, he had powerful friends over the years, uh, Bill Fugazi he grew up with, um, Cy Newhouse he grew up with. Uh, Generosa Pope, he grew up, Richard Hurst, the head of, you know, Richard Berlin, the head of, CEO of Hearst, he grew up with. Generosa Pope was the publisher of the National Enquirer, he founded was. the National and, Enquirer. And Roy Cohn, with his friend Generosa Pope, was ma managed to either kill or get stories in the, in the National Enquirer over and, the years. And we're seeing catch and kill activity by the National Enquirer today. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, yeah. Continue. So he had so all these. I, I was just fascinated who this guy Roy Cohn is and how come he was able to come back from disgrace in a liberal city like New York, even though he'd been disgraced representing a right wing senator, uh, and how he was a, such a power broker. So I set out to profile him. Uh, he at first said he would not cooperate. So I proceeded to just start calling people who knew him, et cetera. And through Stanley Freeman, who I did know uh, over the years in covering New York, I said to Stanley Freeman, I said, look, I don't think it's in Roy Cohn's interest for me just to be talking to his adversaries. I think he wants, and that's who I'm talking to now, and a lot, who would ever talk to me. And, and I think he should talk to me. And within a half hour, Roy Cohn called me, and, and we were on our way. And I spent an enormous amount of time with him over the next several weeks. How many times do you think you met with him? Well, I not only met with him, I, I mean, I had uh, lunches and, and followed him in court uh, in cases uh, and did interviews. I probably did about 12 hours of interviews, taped interviews with him. Now, in the um, course of your research, did you meet Donald Trump? Oh, yeah. Uh, I interviewed Donald Trump once or twice. I don't remember whether it was, it was twice, but it, at some length. Uh, because in connection with Cohn. In connection with Cohn, yeah. He was just, uh, when you talk to, one of the things you try to do with Cohn is find out who his most important clients were. And among them were people like Bess Meyerson, but also people like Donald Trump. So I would call Donald Trump and, and ask him about Roy Cohn. And I found out the story of how they met and, and what Roy Cohn did for Donald Trump as a lawyer. How did they meet? And, uh, what did Roy Cohn do for Ronald Trump, Donald Trump? Donald Trump and his father, they had these uh, Mitchell Lama housing projects, which is where the father made his money initially uh, in both Brooklyn and Queens. But they were being sued uh, by the federal government for housing discrimination, basically saying they were uh, deliberately not renting to minorities in order to keep it all white. And, 
And so Donald Trump went to Roy Cohn, who he had been referred to as, as a killer lawyer, someone who would fight to the death on behalf of his clients. And he, he, he brought the case to Cohn. He told him what it was. But he met him in a bar, hadn't he? Didn't he meet him at the club? He met at the club. You know, I never got into, I never went to the club. It's no longer there, no. obviously. Uh, they did meet there. Donald was a young man about town. He was a bachelor. And he liked to hang out where, where models would go. Uh, places like Friday's and Maxwell's Plum. Um, but it, Cohn apparently went to the club uh, a lot, and that's where Donald met him. But as he told him the story, Donald, I mean, Roy said, let's meet and talk about this. So they met and talked about it. Donald Trump brought the case, and Cohn did what he always did in a case like this. He said, don't worry about a thing. You're going to beat this case. We're going to kill the federal government. Now, uh, Cohn didn't go to the club looking for models. No. Uh, Cohn, Cohn was gay. He was. But did, did, <laughs> you interviewed him. Did, did you did. ask him if he was gay? I did. Uh, I didn't print it, but I'll tell you what happened. Cohn um, was a guy who was black and white. Every, everything was very simple. It was either black or white, yes or no. When I asked him the question, there was a city council resolution at the time, before the city council, should, should you recognize you know, gay marriage? And I asked Roy Cohn. We, we were sitting in his brownstone. Uh, and I'll never forget, he came, it was Brett he, Coffee. He worked out of his uh, home on 68th Street. Yes. And, and he came downstairs in a pink robe. And he was very... Pink robe and pajamas? And I don't know what he had on the pink robe. Mm -hmm. I didn't look. <laughs> it wasn't like Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> but that's like now, now we're in an era where people look. But. Right. And, and um, so we came down to breakfast, and I was having coffee. He had whatever he had. And I said, Mr. Cohn, I said, how do you feel about the city council resolution on gay? He said, and for the first time, he didn't do black or white answer. I'm against it or I'm for it. He said, well, it's a very complicated issue you know you have to look and 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 on the one hand there's this argument on the other hand there's this counter argument and so he didn't come out with a clear position and I looked at him and I said Mr. Cohn are you gay and normally he would answer very quickly any question and he paused a long period of time and Fumford he says I don't know why that's a relevant question blah 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 blah, blah. he never answered the question I never wrote the fact that I asked the question or answered it for the following reason. Um, if I did that, I'd be, the asking of the question that way is to assume that you're guilty if you are gay. Exactly the same kind of thing he did in the R. McCarthy hearings. Are you now or have you ever been a communist? The assumption is that if someone signed up the Communist Party in the 20s or 30s, they were automatically a traitor to the U.S. And I didn't think that was a fair thing to be doing. But I love the fact that I made him suffer, which is why I deliberately did it and why I didn't publish it. Well, in the play uh, Angels in America, Tony Kushner portrays uh, Cohn as a hypocrite because uh, he was uh, closeted gay and uh, he was uh, consistently against gay rights and made uh, 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 almost profane anti-gay remarks from time to time. Um, and he was supposedly engaged to Barbara Walters for a while. He was engaged to Barbara Walters. He, everything was hidden under the rug. He, he, was, uh, he was a hypocrite uh, on that. He, did a, he lived a life that ultimately killed him. He had AIDS. Died of AIDS. He died of AIDS. 1986. But he, he would hang out at a place called Uncle Charlie's South on 2nd Avenue in the, in the 30s. And it was a, a, it was a gay bar with very young boys who go there. And he would hang out there. And Barbara Walters, he, he dated because he knew, uh, he had represented her father, actually, who owned the night. Lou Walters, who owned Walters. the Latin Quarter. And he called her up. And their first date was to go to the Bronx County Democratic Dinner. And they just became friends. They, there was nothing. Roy was not interested in women. And well, that, uh, let's go back to the racial discrimination case. Uh, I think Trump had talked to a number of lawyers, and they said, well, you ought to settle this one, and uh, probably you can get a slap on the wrist where uh, you neither admit nor deny the charges, and uh, nothing's going to happen. But uh, Cohn told him he ought to fight. 
So uh, uh, what was Cohn's strategy in the case? This was, this was typical Cohn and actually has become typical Donald Trump. He, it, what he said is you never apologize, you never admit you were wrong, you fight, you go on the offense, never the defense. You attack, attack, attack. And if you think about Donald Trump as president or as candidate, that's exactly what he's followed, the, the, the dictates of his mentor, Roy Cohn. So what Cohn said to him is, you don't settle, we're going to sue the bastards and we're going to win this case. So he counterclaimed against the government yeah. for $100 which is, million. Dollars. Which is typical, again, put him on the defense, go on the offense. That was Roy Cohn's philosophy as a lawyer, and it became Donald Trump's philosophy as both a businessman and a politician. Now, uh, the counterclaim was dismissed, and uh, I guess around three years later, uh, do you know what the outcome was? They settled. They settled, uh, without admitting or denying the charges, just the, the right. deal that he could have had at when the very was, beginning. When it was out of the news, and it was quietly done. So Donald Trump for, could forever claim he didn't lose that case, we defeated the federal government. He and he claimed even victory, he claimed victory. Even though he did So that was another Roy Cohn trait, wasn't it? But even if you lose, you claim victory. It, it's, it's um, uh, as, <laughs> as one of the late night hosts calls it, truthiness. Right. And, and it, it's alternative facts. Yeah, now one. we're seeing truth decay. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. So he just said, you know, you just claim anything you want. That's what Donald Trump said in the art of the deal. He said, you just claim it's okay to, hyperbole is good. Yes, and all the while saying there was no finding that he had discriminated while well, the evidence was quite overwhelming, as I remember. He did the same thing in the campaign with Trump University. Yes. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sue them, and he quietly, he after the campaign, he settled. He did sue them. Uh, he counterclaimed uh, for a libel against the class plaintiff. Uh, that was eventually dismissed. But in the end, he paid a fine. And he paid, he paid a penalty. Yeah, 20, $25 million. Yeah. Right. yeah. And, uh, but he said he just did that because uh, he was president and didn't have time to defend the case. He and if you won. believe that, I have a bridge I want to sell to you. That's, that's right. So uh, you uh, have uh, uh, called uh, Cohn the personification of evil. So uh, you've talked about who he was, but what was he really like? Why was he the personification of evil? You know, I have never interviewed in the, in the many profiles I've done over the years, um, I've never interviewed or spent time with a more revolting character than Roy Cohn. He had no regard for truth. He, he had just regard for getting out of the hole he was in and saying whatever he had to say to get out of that hole. And if you look at his behavior in the Army McCarthy hearings, basically making wild charges against people, destroying lives, careers, blackballing people. It's the art of the smear. Yeah, he was the art of the smear. And he did this in court, and he did it with great, great joy. And um, the piece was called The Legal Executioner, and I thought he would hate the piece. In fact, he loved the piece at first, because he, it was a calling card for him to be called a legal executioner. I'm going to get more... Good for business. Business. You know, I'm going to, people want to hire me to kill their husband or spouse or kill their business partner. It's a calling card for me. In fact, he called me up after the piece appeared. How do I get 500, pay for 500 copies? And I said, This is because he wanted to give them to his friends or he wanted to take them off the, the news? No, no, he wanted to give them to his friends because yeah. he thought it was good. In the end, he, he, he came to think it was not a favorable piece, so, and I was happy about that. But he would, I remember the first time I sat with him to answer your question about why he was evil. I sat with him at lunch at the 21 Club and where he had a choice table. And, and he didn't order food. I mean, I had a, I must have had a hamburger and french fries. And he would, like lizard-like hands, he would literally take french fries off my plate and feed himself. And I, I thought it was kind of odd, and certainly unusual. And then he would look at his many clients in the room. And to a report of me, um, he would tell me, well, See Bess Myers in a bit? Let me tell you about her divorce. Let me tell you what she did. He was, he was trading information on his many clients in the room, which I thought was unethical. Now, I didn't write any of that. I mean, it wasn't, I'm not a gossip columnist, but I, I, I was appalled by it. I just thought, how does a man do that? But it, it suggested to me that this is a man with no core set of convictions. It's just he was trying to impress me. 
Uh, now, you've talked about his uh, associations with a number of powerful political figures. I guess you omitted Cardinal Spellman, who uh, was uh, in many ways a political figure. Uh, but he also had close ties uh, to uh, the mob, to organized crime. Were you aware of that when you did the interview? Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's in the piece, yes. in the profile. Again... And a couple of Dons were on his speed dial. Yeah, you but, but people hired him, whether they were in the mafia or the Catholic Church, which was assailed. I mean, remember, Cardinal Spellman was being assailed as being a right-wing friend of J. Edgar Hoover, et cetera. Uh, or you were a, a divorcee or someone going through a divorce or a business separation. You hired a lawyer wanting them to kill your opponent, A, and B, give you the confidence that they were totally on your side and they would legally kill your opponent. And that's what Roy, that was his calling card. He did that. And so if you, the mafia loved that, that Roy Cohn was not intimidated by the federal government. He's going to fight the way I would want to fight, they would say. Was it a fact that uh, he met with many of them in his townhouse on 68th oh, Street absolutely. and they went there because they thought there was little danger that uh, a judge would sign a warrant for an eavesdrop in a lawyer's office? That I've never heard. Um, and, and I don't think he just met them at his office. I think he met them in various places, including his office. But um, Cohn acted with impunity. I mean, I don't think he was a guy who thought, even though he'd been indicted, as you said, three, three separate times, I don't think he was a guy who thought he was being wiretapped or anything like that. I just, it, was a, a sense, it was an imperious sense about him, a sense that he can get away with anything. But he had a, uh, at least an affect that uh, he didn't want to be overheard because he was plotting some kind of... Uh Oh, he was paranoid. Uh, of evil. I mean, he was he paranoid. His classic pose was whispering in someone's ear, either McCarthy's or no, uh, no question. Of someone else. And part of that was being paranoid. Now, who, do you remember some of the mob figures he was identified with? Well, he was, I, it's a long time since I, I read that piece I wrote, but it was, it was um, he did represent the guy who walked the streets in his bathrobe. Um, oh, Chin Giganti? Giganti. He represented Giganti. He, I, uh, I think he represented the Genovese family as well. Yeah. Um, I think he went to Carmine uh, Galletti's funeral in uh, the, the funeral home in Brooklyn, the Provenzano he, funeral home. He actually loved talking about why he respected a lot of these mafia dons. He, they didn't rat on their friends. They were loyal to their friends and associates. And they were tough guys. I mean, all three of those things mattered to Roy Cohn. It may not matter to some of the rest of us. Now, he also represented uh, Castellano and Salerno, who um, controlled the uh, poured concrete business in, uh, in New York City and uh, were actually involved in the construction of Trump, of Trump Tower. Uh, in your research, did you find any indication that he introduced Trump to any of his? Uh, I, I did not. Crime uh, I did not, though it's very possible he did. Certainly, uh, that has come out subsequent to that piece, which was '78, that that mobsters had some relationships in doing building. Uh, in, in Trump Tower and, and elsewhere. Yeah, it was a, a grand jury investigation that resulted in indictments. And you had bad people living in Trump Tower. And, you know, and, paying, and yeah. paying big fees. Both for uh, from the Russian mafia and also right. uh, from uh, right. organized crime figures and associates. And, you know, Trump is figures. a guy who, much like Cohn, you, this is business. We're talking about business. So and it's like the godfather. It's yeah. a, it's and, nothing and, personal. It's just business. Yeah, but if, in fact, I can, I can get this building built without labor strikes and difficulties, and these are the people who... Maybe Roy Cohn introduced him to, he, he could well have. Um, that's a great thing. Now, Cohn so, was Trump, also. Trump Tower was not built until the 80s. So until the 80s, that's right. My piece before that. Your piece was 78, but it then was republished during the campaign because mm -hmm. it had a uh, continuing vitality. I guess Cohn was uh, uh, a master of the threatening letter. Trump said uh, he saved us a lot of money because a letter from Roy Cohn sends everyone uh, shivering in their boots. Uh, was, uh, what did you uh, find out about uh, the threatening letters he used to send? Oh, he did it all the time. He, 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 that was his, uh, another calling card for him. He said, I'll handle it. And he would immediately send a bellicose, in-your-face, threatening letter to 
who, the other party, uh, in the hope that they would just retreat and surrender. Uh, and if not, he'd go after them in court. And, and Trump has actually aped that behavior throughout his business career. Did you ever hear that Trump had a uh, photograph of Roy Cohn at his desk and when someone came um, uh, to negotiate a matter, he'd take the photograph out and said, if you don't agree with me, uh, this is my lawyer. And I never heard of the photograph, but Trump, when I interviewed him back in 78, talked about it with, with pride that Roy Cohn was my lawyer and, and you know, that's my armor. You know, if you want to go after me, you're going to have to deal with him. What about manipulating the press? Uh, one of the things Cohn uh, said to you that you quoted was uh, the only uh, form of bad publicity is no publicity. Uh, you think that's another lesson he oh, taught to, uh, to totally. Donald Trump? Totally. And, and you know, Cohn was a guy who, um, as, as Trump used to be, he's no longer this way, where you could write something negative about Cohn as you could write something negative about Trump, and I had experience with both in the, in the 70s and 80s, uh, and yet they, you couldn't offend them. They would come back because they thought it was real important to be in the press because the press helped to find you. I remember writing negative things about Donald Trump and the sweetheart deal he got from the city of New York to build the old Commodore Hotel and get tax avoidance of almost $200 million for that. Uh, and he would call me up and, or write me letters and say, let's have lunch. That's very different than Donald Trump today. But he got that from Roy Cohn. Roy Cohn said, the press is good for you. You need publicity. And spin. Put your spin on it. Uh, it doesn't have to be literally true. Uh, they write it. It will be believed. That's good. And ingratiate yourself with the, the press because he was a source, wasn't he, for page six of the New York Post and Walter Winchell and, and Cindy if Adams. And if you're a source for gossip columnists particularly, if you're a source in general, but it's more so in the gossip world, they allow you to trade in. It, it, it becomes a form of protection. Well, Cindy Adams, who uh, knew Trump very well, was uh, present when Trump learned he had uh, won the election in November of 2016. And she told me that uh, Trump said to her, uh, if uh, Roy Cohn were here, he never would have believed it. Uh, so uh, it would appear that uh, Cohn left an indelible impression. And then we now have uh, the two instances when, since he's been in the White House where he was lamenting the fact that lawyers weren't protecting him in the Russian investigation from uh, Bob Mueller, and he said, uh, my lawyer was Roy Cohn, or I wish I had Roy Cohn here. Uh, do you believe that uh, there was such an indelible impression that Cohn left on uh, Trump? Yeah, I think to Trump, Roy Cohn was a legal executioner. He was someone that you hired who would protect, fiercely protect your back and, and assail your, anyone who was your opponent. And, and he feels that Jeff Sessions has not done that as attorney general for him, and that a lot of his staff doesn't do that, and they leak stuff about him. Roy Cohn was an implacable proponent for Donald Trump. And interestingly, in the end, Roy Cohn felt betrayed by Donald Trump, but we can get to that. Yes, well, uh, uh, of course, Roy Cohn was uh, disbarred. There was a disbarment hearing. Trump. Uh, testified as a character witness. Uh, Trump threw him a party when uh, at Mar-a-Lago just before uh, Cohn died, and uh, Trump went to his funeral. So why was he betrayed? He felt actually, that, but there was a period of time when Roy contracted AIDS and was slowly dying of AIDS. Donald Trump cut him off and did not make those visits, did not reach out in phone calls to him. I think he probably, I'm guessing on this, he probably felt it was kind of disgusting that this guy was, you know, was gay and, and, and was so promiscuous that he, he's dying of that. And don't forget, Donald Trump is a teetotaler. He's a guy whose brother died alcoholism and has always had a view about proper behavior and, and, and unprotected sex, et cetera. So, and you know, he's, a, he's, a, he's germaphobe. I mean, it, Donald Trump wouldn't shake your hand. He does it now because he has to as a, as a candidate or a president. But back in the, in the 70s and 80s, if he went to shake Donald Trump's hand, he would pull it back. Mm. He wouldn't, and he would always have the hand wash with him, you know, to wash his hands. But he, he's a real, so I could see him 
looking with disdain at Roy Cohn's behavior. But in any case, Roy Cohn told, confided to people, including Stanley Friedman, that he felt that, that um, Donald Trump betrayed him and, and was not his loyal friend of the end. And now, did Donald Trump in the end feel guilty about that, go to his funeral? I, I mean, I'm not a psychologist. So I have a question for you, Ken Oletta, because uh, we've run out of time. Do you believe that Roy Cohn is uh, sitting next to Donald Trump in the White House, whispering in his ear today? I think Donald Trump um, internalized the lessons he got from his mentor, Roy Cohn, and, and acts out what he was taught by Cohn. Attack, never apologize, never be on defense, hyperbole or exaggeration Threaten is good. and lie. Threatening is good. We call it a lie. He doesn't, but I would. There it is. Ken Oletta, thank you so much My for pleasure. coming by. This has been marvelous. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care and all the best.